Can you guys see my breath? <laughs> Winter hit pretty hard here in the Pacific Northwest, and it's been three months to the day since I released a video uh, showing you guys the progress on this on the motorhome. I haven't been doing a whole lot to the motorhome, but I have been working, and hey, humongous thank you to whoever it was that shared this channel like thank you guys I, I asked you guys to do that in the last video and somebody followed through and blew my channel up so this is now a viable channel I was able to monetize and I've got I think almost 4,000 subscribers so I can actually you know justify <laughs> spending time out here so the plan is to release at least one video per month uh, about the progress that I'm making here on the motorhome this is one of many irons that I have on the fire. You guys know I, I run a bag company, uh, packbags.com, and I have the other YouTube channel, Design Prototype Test, and I have, you know, I gotta hang out with my kid. He's two years old, and you know, there's just, there's lots of things that I'm balancing in life, so uh, this is one of many, so you guys can't expect too much from me, but definitely subscribe and ring the bell because I will be releasing videos somewhat regularly from here on out, so let's get into the topic of this video, which is going to start with the airbag suspension. Take a look at the airbag here. This is the uh, the rear uh, passenger side, and you can see the airbag here is at about 15, 20 psi, and so the motorhome is sagging quite a bit. Um, and this is after three months of sitting, so my airbags are in decent shape. Um, they could certainly be better. Um, you know, someday I'm going to have to to replace those, which is kind of a bummer. I would love to keep the original. In order to pump this up, we need to turn the uh, the the thing on. We need to get that engine started. So it's been sitting for three months. That gas is getting old, but uh, I think it'll start right up. Let's give it a try. All right, let's uh, let's see how this works for for all of you millennials out there, or anybody who's never owned a carbureted engine. You're in for a treat. This is this is how you start an old vehicle. Well, the battery's dead, so that's. That's not how you start an old vehicle. First, you have to charge the battery. Bummer. And this is why that happened. My two-year-old comes in here and just loves to turn all the knobs and dials, and he left the radio on. So the radio has been on for three months, and so that re that battery's going to be deader than dead. Huh, I hope it didn't kill the battery. Like, dead dead. I hope I don't have to buy a new one of those. And the most painful part about this situation is I could have just used the, uh, the battery disconnect and uh, saved it that way not had to worry about a battery running out of juice. Well, it's now tomorrow. You can see it rained last night. There's water on the ground. And I had my charger underneath the bucket all night long just so it didn't get wet uh, sitting out here in the rain. And you can see I had it at the uh, the 2 amp, 12 volt 2 amp, uh, charging all night long. And you can see it's sitting there in the red. Uh, so I don't know. Hopefully it worked. So let's uh, let's give a check. The charger is unplugged. The, uh, the battery is reading 13.39 volts. And if I take off, you know, just in case there's like a capacitor on the, on the charger. Yeah, buddy, 13.07 volts. I think we're saved. God, lucky. I mean, obviously this life of this battery just got greatly shortened, but it'll work for now. And it's cold. We're gonna be cranking for a little while. There it is. Two pumps on the gas pedal is all it took. So we'll let this thing get up to temperature. Let's pump up those airbags. So here's the um, here's the switch for the airbag. So this is the left rear, that's the right rear, and this just turns them on. So back here past the galley is the uh, the electronic, or the mechanical closet where you can see the, uh, the pump. That's what's pumping up the airbags. Let's go take a look. It's gonna be slow, but it's gonna it's gonna get this back up to height. Wow, that is completely flat now. That's bizarre. Something happened, huh? Oh, maybe I let all the air out. Maybe that's what that button does. Let's um, let's do this. Oh yeah, see that's the lower button and that's the raise. So left rear. I mean, we should check that one too. one's nice and full getting lift up higher and higher and the throttle on the engine just kicked in you can hear the engines racing a little bit more well that 
it took a couple of minutes, but you can see uh, it's nicely inflated now, and the metal cones are sticking out uh, where they're supposed to be. Now, these cones are the special sauce that makes the original factory airbags uh, so much more comfortable than all the aftermarket versions, because the cones give it a, um, an increasing spring rate the farther down in the travel that you are. So in other words, the, the, the airbag pushes harder on the tires to try to lift the, uh, to try to lift the motor home. It pushes harder as you're lower and lower. Uh, so it just, it makes it much more comfortable. It's kind of an, uh, a progressive shock, basically. Well, now that that's taken care of, let's talk about other mechanical issues uh, here in the motorhome. So the biggest one is the fuel filter. I think, I think it's the fuel filter. Here's the problem. When I'm at 85, 90% throttle, up to then, everything works great in the motorhome. It just, it goes down the road, no problems. But as soon as I floor it all the way, 85, 90%, it does this thing. And yeah, it seems like a fuel issue. So maybe it's the fuel pump or maybe it's the fuel filter. So the fuel filter is pretty easy to replace. So I have to do that, not in this episode. We'll do that at a later, in a later video. Um, but the other mechanical issue to deal with is the fuel gauge. For whatever reason, they're just not working. I'm not, I'm not seeing how much uh, gas I have in the two fuel tanks. And so I need to dive into there. Now, thankfully, somebody cut a hole in the floor right over the access to the fuel tanks. So they're easy to get to uh, when it's in this torn down uh, you know, situation like I am now without the carpet on there. So I should be able to get the fuel uh, gauges working as well. But both of those issues I'm gonna put off uh, to a later episode. Now the guy who I bought the motorhome from, Dan, he did a pretty good job uh, getting this thing mechanically, you know, running. And I drove it down from Seattle, three hour drive, and I had no issues um, except for, you know, the gas. He did things like replacing the coolant line. This coolant line here goes all the way from the engine to the water heater in the back. So it wraps around the water heater and you're, you're warming your shower water with engine heat. Pretty cool uh, stuff for 1978. But yeah, so there, there are other mechanical issues to deal with and I will be getting to them. But what I want to do right now is uh, actually start to work on the, the, the entryway here. And specifically, I want to put a step here in this door. Now it's not a big step up to begin with to get up in there, but it would be nice just to have, you know, a place to put my foot right there to get up in there, especially for my two year old. And I happen to have a step. So let's move into the garage and start to work on this. So I'm out here uh, working in the garage and it's nighttime. I get my best work done at night because the family has gone to sleep and there's no distractions. So um, the problem that I have uh, doing this work is the lighting and I'm betting that the, uh, the camera isn't doing such a great job filming in the low light either, but let me show you what I'm working with. So this is the incandescent bulb there, and then there's one over there. This is a two car garage that I work in. Yeah, you can just see this house was built in like the 60s or the early 70s, and that's uh, you know what they used to do back then. I read here, and I didn't really wanna install like you know some, some row lights of fluorescent lighting. And then, you know, I, I was basically just going with it. But this company from China, Sansi, S-A-N-S-I-L-E-D.com, uh, they reached out to me and they offered me a solution that I never knew I wanted uh, until they offered it to me. So uh, I got these given to me, just you know, so you guys know. But I'm not, I'm not selling them. They just wanted me to tell you guys about them, and I think they're pretty great. So let's um, open this box up and put the put the light in the ceiling there, and I'll show you guys what a difference it makes. Well, I've already got the first one installed, but let me show you guys uh, what they look like when you open the box. I've got to give props to whoever came up with this uh, with this motif or, 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 or whatever you want to call it, this, this shape. So basically, you can see there's a um, just a regular thread, just like your normal bulb, right? Um, but then there's these wings, or arms, whatever you want to call them, that fold down uh, on all four sides. And you can aim these. So if you want all the light to be directly underneath the spot where your, where your light bulb screws in, you can have them be flat or you can have them aim up at an angle. I mean, there is the ceiling that I have to worry about. If I could drop that down, then I could aim them uh, quite a bit more. But yeah, check out what the first one looks like in the ceiling. Pretty cool, huh? And so that is casting all kinds of great light. So let me get uh, this second one here installed. So that is a total improvement. And um, 
yeah, I wish I would have done this a lot sooner. I've been working out here for a year in that dim light. So for anybody who's curious, um, this is what the, uh, the light distribution curve looks like. So it's a pretty white light and it is so much brighter in here. I'd say it's about, geez, maybe 10 times brighter. It's, it, this is a real workshop now. I can work under this. And um, because they're LEDs, I'll bet I'm not burning any more electricity than I was with those inefficient incandescent bulbs. So let's get back to work. For those of you who watched the second episode in this series about my GMC motorhome, you will have seen me uh, pulling this step off of that donor motorhome that was sitting in a field. And unfortunately, the removal did not go smoothly. So first of all, uh, this corner broke off and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna braze that together. I don't have an aluminum TIG welder or anything like that. And it doesn't, it, 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 um, it doesn't really need to be there. It's not, even though it's broken off, it broke off while I was stressing it, removing it. So um, yeah, it'll be fine being brazed on there. But the big problem that I have is this step here is meant to sit um, just like that. And then it folds up when you're going down the road and then it folds down when you want to use it. And um, it was in the down position uh, on the motorhome and I stuck just a shovel underneath there in the dirt and I literally had to use the, all the leverage on the shovel to get it to swing up into place so that I could crawl underneath and undo the bolts to remove the step. And while I used that shovel with all the leverage, what happened is I sheared or twisted the, the bolts off. It's just crazy. So what we have here is um, a galvanic action i think that's what it's called basically you have dissimilar metals uh steel and aluminum and in the presence of like road salts or any salt and water um you get this electro uh you know there's a slight electro you know di difference between those two which causes them the, the metals to fuse in just a terrible way so it's it's really bad corrosion and so i need to somehow extract the harder steel out from the softer aluminum. And to that end, over here on this side, I've carefully centered a drill and drilled out as much of that steel as I can get to. And I've done the same right here as well. And so after I'd done that, I went to Harbor Freight and I got one of these uh, extractor sets. Now, um, if you're unfamiliar with this, it's, it can be an incredibly useful tool. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, if these bolts are gonna break off, um, this is, probably not going to work. I, it was worth a shot though, so I went and bought the uh, the tool set anyway. But what this is, is it's a reverse thread. So you see as I'm loosening this thread, I'm actually actually tightening it up. So what you do is you stick it in the hole, right? And then you lefty loosey, right? And as you're lefty loosening, it's actually tightening this thing down, which is trying, it's gripping, it's biting more and more into the bolt that you drilled a hole into. And so it, it can, it actually, you know, rotates the bolt out. So if you've ever broken a bolt head off of something and you need to get that, uh, that shaft out of the hole, this is how you do it. But uh, it's not gonna work here in this instance. So the thing that I need to do is uh, somehow dissolve away the steel without uh, messing up the aluminum. So here's the set. This is a container with water in it into which I've dissolved this entire bottle of alum. Now this is a aluminum uh, salt basically and you can buy this at the grocery store. So this is supposed to dissolve steel and leave the aluminum untouched. But what I've got here is an incandescent light bulb which is keeping the water above room temperature. So it is warm and that's supposed to help the reaction take place. But for two days, this has been sitting here like this and all that's happened is the salt has precipitated out at the bottom there. There's a bunch of salt on the bottom of the container and some of it's even precipitated out onto the side of the aluminum, as you can see. So, um, but what hasn't happened is the steel has not dissolved, not even a little bit. It's uh, changed color ever so slightly, but other than that, it's unchanged. So I'm officially saying that this myth is busted. You cannot dissolve steel with alum salts in water. I have to boil off all this water so that I can save all the alum salt because this little container here cost me $5 and I don't really wanna be wasteful and throw this away just to go buy another container. I decided that I wanted to quickly boil the alum out of the water that was in this container. So I poured it into my stainless steel pan here. And in about two minutes, look at how much it discolored the pan. 
So a quick scrub with an abrasive pad and this pan has never been so clean. I think I've just discovered a new pan cleaning technique for after I've boiled my uh, oatmeal to the bottom of the pan. Well, uh, despite the vigorous boil and all the bubbles uh, coming off of the, uh, you know, in, off the metal, off the steel, um, it didn't, it didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't dissolve the steel away. I had it boiling there on the, uh, on the kitchen stove for a good two hours and nothing. I mean, it, it made it a little bit more rusty, but that's about it. So watching other videos, doing more research on the internet, um, I came upon somebody who says that you can definitely get this to work if you use alum salts in battery acid, which seems insane to me. But, um, you know, this is a $200 step that I got for free, and this is like $10 in battery acid and $5 in alum salt, so I'm gonna give it a try, but you can be damn certain that I'm not gonna be boiling battery acid in the kitchen. So what I've got here is a Pyrex glass bowl, because we know that steel will react, and so I'm not gonna use stainless steel. I guess I could get an aluminum pan, that would've worked, but we'll just use this Pyrex glass instead. I ordered more alum salt um, off of eBay, so it was less expensive than this $5 one, um, which you can see that I've boiled down and, and I've got some of the salts left, although they're pretty grody, they're pretty dirty. So, I don't know, I'm gonna try this stuff from eBay. Um, and then I've got this hot plate also from, uh, from Goodwill that I, uh, that I just got for cheap. So we're talking like $15 here uh, plus another seven for that. So uh, not too much com compared to uh, buying a new $200 step. So I'm really, you know, crossing my fingers that this is gonna work. So I have the, uh, the parts to the step here wired to the ceiling and you can see they're dangling uh, into the Pyrex bowl nicely. They've got a little bit of movement, but they're not gonna go anywhere. So the next step is to pour this sulfuric acid uh, into there and mix it with the alum salts. Um, this is, I think, like a 30% solution of sulfuric acid, just regular old battery acid from the auto parts store. And uh, one time I was filling up a wet battery for my motorcycle and I splashed some of this uh, onto my pants. Nice pair of jeans too. Um, if you ever had bleach on your pants, this is a lot worse. So. Uh, this is kind of crazy to me. I, you know, it's a weird chemistry experiment. Okay, I've got my eye protection on, got my gloves. Oh, that stuff stinks. Whew. Oh, it smells like sulfur, sulfuric acid, huh? Yuck. And I'm gonna need some more because I haven't um, fully, you know, uh, sunk the steel into the acid, but I think I'm gonna dilute this instead. Now let's add the salt. About half the bag. I don't know, maybe it's too much. So what I'm gonna do is just, I'm just gonna let this sit overnight for like eight hours without turning the, uh, the hot plate, you know, single burner thing on. Uh, just see what it does without the heat. I mean, it's pretty cold tonight. It's almost, it's getting down near what, like 40 degrees, something like that, 30, 38 degrees, so. Uh, I don't expect a whole lot of reaction, but it'll be interesting to see in the morning. And then when I can supervise this for a couple of hours tomorrow, uh, that's when I'll turn the, uh, the burner on. So let's see what happens. I might not need the boiling water after all, you guys. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but um, basically the reaction's already started back there. Can you see it just sort of uh, bubbling up off of the steel? A nice little plume of, of reactant bubbles. So um, I think that just leaving this thing overnight might uh, might do the trick. So, so we'll see what I wake up to in the morning. Not much changed overnight. You can see uh, it's still bubbling quite a bit uh, on both of them. Although this one here bubbling a whole lot more than that one, uh, which is annoying because this is the one that's uh, that's thinner. So that there's less material that needs to be bubbled away in the first place. I think it's time to uh, to turn the heat on and see how vigorous we can get this. Uh, this dissolving action to happen. Well, I can confidently report that boiling battery acid is an extreme irritant to your respiratory system. So I will be wearing my painting respirator uh, every time I go in the garage right now. Both garage doors are wide open uh, to get the fumes out of there, but you can see it's definitely working. See the vigorous boil right there uh, where the steel is. So I think it won't be very long until all that steel is gone. A complete and total disaster the 
glass Pyrex has shattered and dripped battery acid salt all over. Gotta pull all that out of there and hose it down and try to clean up the battery acid the best I can. This is, this is horrible. Time out before uh, all of the extremely critical comments that I'm sure are coming my way start rolling in. Let me just say that I was in full protective gear when this accident happened like this. And um, I think the accident was caused by a thermal expansion problem. I, I poured um, room temperature filtered water to replenish the bath. I poured that into the acid bath uh, because a lot of the, the fluid level had dropped. And I poured the water in at a trickle down along the step, which you know has been sitting in boiling water for two hours. So the step should be very warm. But apparently that didn't warm up the water enough and it shocked the uh, the glass cookware and, and the cookware exploded. But it didn't happen immediately because I poured it in slowly and everything was fine. And you know, I walked away. And in fact, I was out in the front yard 50 feet away when I heard the pop and returned into the garage, you know, through the wide open garage doors. Both garage doors are open and uh, saw the same disaster area that you guys saw just now. So. I debated whether or not to even include this whole uh, disaster in this video um, because it's not necessary to, to show the final product. And um, yeah, I think that boiling battery acid is an extremely stupid thing to do. So I, I'm not intending this video or really any of my videos to be uh, how-to videos unless I title them how-to. It's more just sort of a, a documentation of the process that I went through to achieve the results that I achieved. Not that it's the ideal way to do it. And in fact, I welcome criticism. Chemistry is not my strong suit. I've never done anything like this before. Uh, and you know, obviously I made a mistake with that cookware. Um, so lesson learned. And really, I don't think that anybody should be doing this anyway. But if you do do it, don't pour cooler water into the acid bath. All right, let's get back to the video and start the cleanup process. Well, all things told, it's not too bad. I just got that wet spot you see there. Didn't even get on my little CNC machine. Just got to throw that box away. Got all the stuff down there, I'm gonna hose it off. Um, and then I've got some uh, baking soda in water to neutralize uh, all the acid. And yeah, it shouldn't be the worst thing, just about an hour worth of cleanup. But the Pyrex glass should not have broken. I guess it wasn't genuine Pyrex. The good news is it absolutely worked. There's no longer any steel down there in the hole. So pretty cool, pretty cool. The, uh, the baking soda water uh, reacts with the acid kind of cool actually. Uh, here I'll show you guys. Squeeze a little bit of it on there. You can just hear it go. So soak this thing in baking soda water and hopefully neutralize all the acid that's spilled. This is uh, side number two that's going to soak overnight uh, in the battery acid and alum salt and then tomorrow we will try to boil this in the new uh, glass container and hopefully we don't have a second disaster. But if we do, we're in a Tupperware tub this time, so everything should be okay. Today is now tomorrow, and this has been boiling for about uh, an hour and a half, and the water level is looking a little bit low, so I need to uh, replenish the water without uh, you know, exploding my glass Pyrex container like I did last time. Success, no exploding glass. The parts are done. There's no more steel left in the aluminum. So now it's just time to clean up. And now I just gotta put this toxic waste back into the battery acid container and I don't know, save it for the next project. Here you can see the, uh, the two slugs, that's what's left of the bolts and then all the, uh, all the schmoo. And the next problem I have is um, this broken piece right here that I kind of want to reattach. Now, it's really not critical, and the only reason it broke is because I was just uh, being so ungentle 
trying to get it off the uh, the rusted old you know donor vehicle that I pulled this from. So what you can see that I've tried to do here is use this aluminum brazing rod and braze it back in place. Um, I'm using this map gas on this plumber's torch and it's working to get the brazing to stick to the small piece. So the small piece is getting up to temperature but the lower piece is just such a heat sink it's just sucking all the heat away down you know into this big heat sink basically and uh, so it won't stick to the lower portion. And so that's just, uh, it's not gonna work. So I need another solution. And what you can see over here, the way this is gonna work, I'm gonna use one of these big fender washers to just sort of hold it in place. And um, this isn't even, this is always pressing upwards. It's pressing that way. It's not ever pressing this way uh, unless you do something very bad, like hit a curb with it or something. Uh, so I think that this solution will work just fine. I've 3D printed this flexible sock and I can just slide that right over it. And once I've slid that down, I can drill a new hole uh, through the sock. And this will also get me a little bit of separation between the aluminum and the steel uh, frame underneath the motorhome. So I think this is the ideal solution. That'll do. Man, this thing makes short work of polishing this up, but uh, it sure does vibrate a lot. My hands are going numb. Well, now that that's all polished up with the wire wheel, we can see just how severe the pitting is where this was in the bath. So the acid bath went up to about there, and that's where the pitting starts and stops. So this is definitely not a technique if you need a nice, uh, smooth finish part. Uh, in fact, I can't imagine uh, another situation where this technique would actually be okay, because the pitting really doesn't matter here on this step. It's uh, it's not gonna, it's gonna add grip, so. Uh, but for any other application, I absolutely would not use an acid bath uh, like I did. And the final thing to do before installation is to get the uh, the hinge pins uh, working and replaced. So uh, I've drilled out those holes. They were, what, 11 64ths or whatever the, the one tiny size smaller than 3 8 would be. So I drilled them out to 3 8 of an inch, and this is a 3 8 bolt. I'm going to use the smooth section there, so I just have to cut the threads off and cut the head off. Um, and that should work just fine. Now you can see I've got that little black spacer. That's just one of these 3D printed washers that should uh, give me a nice, it just keeps it from flopping back and forth. So should keep the, uh, the step nicely centered and prevent it from rattling. That's why they call it a ball peen hammer. Okay, got the hardware all lined up. Everything's ready. There it is, in place in the motorhome. Pretty good uh, clearance when it's folded up. Good design. You can see I currently have the step being held up by that jack. So now comes the easiest part of the whole job. I have to drill four holes. Um, and then just put the bolts through there. Bolts and nuts. It's super easy. And the drill will not fit under the motorhome. How frustrating, right? I mean, you get all that way and then you just you can't get the drill under there. So I have a couple of options. First, I can jack up the motorhome on jack stands. But my driveway's at kind of an angle, so I would have to put uh, chalk blocks, you know, at, at all the wheels except for those two um, to lift it up into the air. Uh, so that I can get my drill under there. I could also go buy like a right angle drill attachment. Those are pretty low profile. Um, but I have a couple of projects coming up with the floor here. And I also want to build these, um, I don't know what you call them, but they're basically two by four uh, lifts for your, for your tires. It's a special project that somebody posted on the internet about these GMC motorhomes. So once I build those, I'll be able to get under the motorhome to access like the black water tank and the gas tanks and that sort of a thing. So I really shouldn't waste the time to jack up the motorhome just to drill those four holes. Not yet. I will be under there in the future and when I'm under there, I'm just going to, uh, you know, bang that job out at the same time. It should be super easy 
just those four holes. Two of them are in metal, and then two of the holes are on the uh, the fiberglass skirt, the SMC sheet molded compound. Uh, so it's it's really no big deal. It's going to be the easiest installation. It's just that I can't get a drill under there. So that's going to pretty much do it for this video. Uh, once again, thank you to whoever blew up this channel by sharing it uh, in the last video. That really helped, and now I can definitely make this uh, this channel a priority. So please continue to share uh, on your favorite social media sites or however you did it. I don't know how you guys did it, but um, yeah, ring the bell because I'm only releasing a video once a month, and I do plan on doing it once a month. I, that's my goal. So you can you can <laughs> chastise me in the comments if you don't see a video at least once a month. Um, but even once a month is not enough for the YouTube algorithm to feed you my videos. So you're going to have to uh, ring the bell and click on the always notify me if you don't want to miss a single video that I release about this motor. So that's where that stands. All right. Thanks for watching. See you next time.